last night at our get-together, the young people, I referenced uh, David fighting Goliath. And it all had to do really with saying, what will you do even though other people aren't doing it? What is your personal responsibility? Because we know that David could have come to bring food as he did to his brothers. And when he got there, he found that the Philistines had sent out Goliath as a champion for them and in so doing offered Israel to send out their champion and whichever one won, then the other people would serve them. David was not even a soldier. He could have very well said, even when he understood what was happening, that, well, I've done what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going back home. Nobody expects anything out of me on this. I'm not even a trained soldier. My brothers are here. The army of Israel is here. But that's not the way he thought, was it? He remembered that God had delivered a bear into his hands while he was guarding his father's flock. He remembered the same thing regarding protecting the flock from a lion. And he used what he had to kill those animals, which is the same thing he had to deal with Goliath because they tried to outfit him in regular accoutrement of a soldier of that day and time. And as he said, I don't know how to use this, and evidently it didn't fit him too well. What made David step up there and do that when all the army of Israel wouldn't do it? The king wouldn't do it. His brothers ridiculed him over it. Why didn't he just never bring it up? His job was to bring food to his brothers. And once he had done that, he had fulfilled what he was sent there to do. Why didn't he go back home? I suggest to you there are a great many people like that in the church today. They are the let George do it people. Well, somebody else can do it. Somebody else more capable doing it. Dave, you could have reasoned that way. Aren't these people professional soldiers? I'm not. He didn't think that way. And when his brethren ridiculed them for asking questions, making comments about the whole thing, and he responded to them. He responded to them with a question. And this is what I mentioned last night. Is there not a cause? There are a lot of people who don't know there's a cause. There's a whole host of people who say, I'm God's great servant. But here are things that need to be done. And some of them not pleasant at all. Some of them are requiring a great deal of sacrifice. Some of them requiring effort on your part when you don't know that you're really capable of doing it. But there's a cause. The cause, in our case, of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and being members of His blood-bought body of the church. Is there not a cause today that demands from each one of us as members of that church having been buried with him in baptism where the blood of Christ shed on the cross of Calvary was applied to us and our sins remitted. And we're now soldiers of Christ. And lo and behold, we sing a song sometimes echoing that sentiment. Soldiers of Christ arise. Put your armor on. Well, what does that mean to you? Some of us are, we don't know there is any armor. <laughs> Some of us uh, we just as soon not go shop for armor. <laughs> and some of us don't want to even find out there really is any anyway. But the Bible is replete with material that says you have to do what you can do. And you won't get any better at it till you step out and do it. And David, of course, became known as one of the greatest soldiers in the army of Israel. Well, that was written aforetime for David Brown to read and learn and to apply to my own life, whether anybody else does it or not. And that's why I'm appealing to you. Whether anybody else does what God says because they don't recognize there's a cause. What about you? 
We all have to answer that question. Now, if you're just thinking about the general work of the church, even things done around building and so forth, then that's one thing. But when, when it requires effort that's going to put you in a bad light with people, it's going to make people not like you, oh, go further than that, to hate you, that cause is still there. And because David had turned around and went home didn't mean Goliath wasn't going to keep coming out and saying, send out your champion. But because that one person, David, because simply of his faith in God to deliver that person into his hands, he did what he could. He took what he had and that he was familiar with and he dealt with him. And ended that matter right there. Now in the church, and while Christ was on the earth before the church was established, our Lord, in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, in the last ones of the beginning in verse 10, of all things, <laughs> of all things had this to say, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But I like the latter part of that. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You like that? But the first comes before the last. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now what's my attitude? I'm going back home. Did I say there was a cause? <laughs> Well, really, it wasn't that big a cause. He says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? I like this part too. For great, not just a reward in heaven, but great is your reward in heaven. In effect, he says, that's the way they've always dealt with God's people who knew there was a cause and did what they could where they could, even when it put their life in jeopardy. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now that... Uh, is a vaccination. You know, people are asking now, since Texas, by the way, is one of those states that's really being hit hard by influenza. You know, have you been vaccinated? Well, I remember back the time when there wasn't any polio vaccination. And people just, some of you older ones remember this. When that polio vaccination came out, they lined up by the droves because when summer got here in polio season, so many young people were coming down with polio. And now they had a vaccination. And it was great. And then when the other vaccination came out, that was one you took in a sugar cube, they all lined up for that one too. Well, I wonder, do we not understand Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who would die for us in such an ignominious, cruel manner, suffer so much for us, that he's giving us the vaccination right here? He was vaccinating the people of his day who would love him and obey him and have to endure all these trials and scourgings and evil because there's a cause. Can you think of a greater cause than the cause of Christ to win people to Christ through the gospel and to strengthen the church to remain faithful and pure? Tell me a greater cause. Because this cause doesn't end with this life. It doesn't end with my life. It goes right on into eternity. And that is a wonderful thing. You know, Peter understood that as well as anybody since he heard the Lord say these things in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. And so in writing to Christians many years later, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he said this to those Christians, our brethren, who had obeyed the same gospel we did, members of the same church. By the way, they still are. They're just out of the body in, in eternity. He said to them in verse 21 of 1 Peter 2, For he even here and too were you called. Well, what called us the gospel? He called us to God to receive remission of sins, to receive sonship, to receive all spiritual blessings in heavenly places because we've been added to the church. Ephesians 1.3 and Acts 2.47. 
But he's talking primarily here in the context of suffering for the cause of Christ. For even here and to where you called, because Christ also suffered for us. Now, what does that do? He says, leaving us an example, a pattern for us to follow, that ye should follow in his steps. Now, that's true of everything about Christ, but he's anchoring this in the context of suffering for righteousness' sake. Was there a cause for Christ? Yes. To save our souls from sin, and look what it put him through to be able to save me and to save you from sin. Now notice it says plainly from verse, in verse 22, Of Christ who did no sin, neither was guile, anything bad, wicked, found in his mouth. And notice how he suffered. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. He didn't practice the thing the revilers do. And yet the revilers were wrong. The revilers were wicked in thought, word, and action. The revilers didn't care about anything but getting what they wanted, and in Christ's case, it was killing. There wasn't anything Christ could do to be right with God and then say, well, that'll make it right with the Caiaphas and Annas and the high priests and the scribes. There was one thing that was going to satisfy those people, and that is kill Christ. You could be logical with them. You could quote Scripture to them. Why, you could work miracles and prove you're the Son of God. How far did they get Christ? They still cried, crucify him, crucify him. And they did. Taunted him while he was on the tree. So when he was reviled, he, he didn't revile again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten them. You don't shut up, I'm going to slap your mouth. He didn't do that. But committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now I wonder who that is. Who is it that judges righteously? Well, since Christ has gone back to heaven and will come back at the end of time, he said himself in John 12, verse 48, that he would be the judge. Paul said that uh, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. So we commit ourselves as members of his spiritual body, following in his footsteps, following his example of how to suffer righteously, we commit it to him. It doesn't mean you don't try to teach the truth where people are teaching error. It doesn't mean you don't try to write things that are wrong. But it means when people are saying or doing something to you that's wrong and they know it's wrong or whether they don't know it's wrong, make any difference, it, uh, it's persecuting you because you do what's right. Then who is going to know how to judge them exactly, perfectly? Well, it's God. God who knows all. God will tend to them. I find that to be a great deal of removing a lot of things from my mind. You know what? We used to, my grandmother used to sing an old song, and no telling where it came from. I, I've been trying to find it on, because I don't know all of it. But Daddy sang it to us, and I just can't remember all the words, but it was designed to scare kids <laughs> into doing right. And it goes, woo, 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 the wind is saying, while the goblins are at play, you better be good. Or the goblins from the wood will carry you away someday. <laughs> well, now there's some truth in that because someday the righteous judge is going to deal with those people that refuse to hear the truth, believe it, and obey it, or who believe it and obey it and renounce it. I don't have to worry about that. You ever notice how many people got all upset years ago about OJ getting off? Nobody gets off when all said and done with sin. Vengeance is mine, God said. I will repay. And I promise you, no matter how much you might like to bat somebody up by the side of the head, the ball will bat, and they may really need it. You're not going to wreak vengeance on somebody like God Almighty is going to do it. Because here's what it comes down to. You remember when the people desired to have a king for the purpose of being like the nations round about them? And it really upset Samuel. God had to remind Samuel, great as he was in service to God, they haven't rejected you. They have rejected me. You do not persecute the faithful of the church without persecuting Jesus Christ. You will notice that when Stephen was dying, the first Christian martyr, you ever notice that he saw the Lord 
standing at the right hand of God. In other pictures, he's seated as in the place of authority. Do you know what standing indicates? Concern. Concern. The first Christians dying as Christ died. And he's pictured as standing at the right hand of God. We forget sometimes we're members of the church. We're sons of God. Not many in the world, you know. God takes note of what's done to his faithful children. And let's put it like we would say it. He doesn't like it when it's bad. He wants us to do just like Christ did and not revile again. Because he'll judge righteously. And after all, as the rain falls on the just and the unjust, showing how God deals with people in this life, then we must function the same way. But we must also find great, great consolation in the fact that God will take care of the matter better than we thought we ever could. If you will look in what is said by Paul to the Thessalonians, he causes them to find great comfort of what's going to be when the Lord comes back. When it comes to how he's going to deal with the people who won't listen to the truth, who won't live by the truth, who won't obey the truth, and listen to what he says. Beginning in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Why is that in your Bible? Why is that a part of the New Testament of who? Of Jesus Christ. Why is it written to churches? Because that's what is to comfort us. But he doesn't stop there, does he? That's not even the end of the sentence. In verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When is it all going to be leveled out? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now can you do that if you want to try to really get after somebody that needs it? No. But he says that's not all of it when he's revealed. He'll be revealed in flaming fire. Taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. But what's going to be with us who die faithful, who live righteous lives, who strive all our lives to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Here's what it's going to be with us when he comes, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Why? Why? Parenthetically, he says, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Why is that in the Bible? Why is it written to the church? To strengthen us. Now, I don't suppose anybody among mere humans ever lived as close to the Lord as did the great Apostle Paul in faithful service to God. And he had this to say about the exemplary life that he lived when he wrote to the young preacher Timothy, who he upheld as somebody that was as close to him as anybody could be in what life was all about and what they were to be doing in the church. And in 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 10, the scripture reads, To Timothy he wrote, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, Charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Now look at the faith of Paul. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Then he says one we quote many times for reading the forgetting the context, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. What's going to happen to evil men? But evil men and seducers, you know any of them, shall wax worse and worse. It's not better and better. See, I think sometimes we think wicked people, people who live contrary to the truth, 
who are not honest at heart. I think we think as they persecute us, they're going to get better and better. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says such characters will wax worse and worse. And, and how is it so that they'll get worse and worse? Deceiving and being deceived. Once you start down the path of believing a falsehood and telling yourself that's right because it suits your whatever it is you've got planned, then you lay the groundwork for more falsehood. There's two things in this world that we're to follow. Truth and error. And error is a lie. So you either follow the truth or you follow a lie. There's no in-between. Everybody in this room is following the truth of Jesus Christ and you love it and you follow it or you're not. Now if you're not, then you're going to follow that which makes you worse and worse because that makes you an evil man. And that makes a seducer draws you away from the right way. You seduce. You seduce by lies. And that means you're going to get worse and worse. You don't get better and better. Deceiving others and being deceived so you blind yourself to the only way that could cause you to see reality like God wants you to because you're not honest hearted Luke 8 and verse 15 but you must be honest hearted to receive the truth and it benefits you like God intended well if you're not honest hearted how are you going to take the truth and apply it to your life like you ought to people are either seeking to justify themselves in their sins or they're seeking forgiveness of sins now, you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, then what other way is there? You're either in the straight and narrow way, bound in all sides by the truth of God's word, or you're walking that broad way. Is there a third way? <laughs> and that's it. But continue, he says to Timothy, continue. In other words, you're already in it. Don't get out of it. Stay with it. Continue. Thou and the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had a Jewish mother and grandmother. They had anchored him into the Old Testament scriptures and laid a foundation that prepared him to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he had all that going for him. So if you're going to escape these folks who don't love the truth, who are dishonest, who are seducers, who wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, then you stay with that truth that started right when you were taught by, by your mom and grandmother. And then the gospel I preached to you because it was Paul who first came across Timothy in Antioch. And he knew what Paul had done for the truth. He knew what he had suffered for the truth. He had accompanied him along those lines. He had seen these things. What a difference that must have made. But now that's a general statement. All these persecutions that Timothy knew Paul had gone through. Paul in defending his apostleship to the church in Corinth gets pretty specific as to what he went through. Because there were these folks who are saying, I'm just as good as Paul as far as being an apostle. And you really can't trust him because he wasn't with the original apostles. And you don't even know that he's an apostle. That's why he's teaching that you uh, don't have to be circumcised as far as the Judaizing teachers and what they taught to the Gentiles. So Paul defended his apostleship. And he said, of those, are they Hebrews or am I? I don't think you could out-Jew Paul <laughs> as far as his pedigree is concerned. Are they Hebrews or am I? Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Why would he do that? That's all according to the flesh because that's how they were saying they were as much and as good as anybody and better than Paul. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Got a problem in the Christian life? I want to know tonight if you have a certain place to go back home and rest. I want to know what there is that you're being deprived of simply and only because you're a Christian. <clears throat> Tell me about that suffering. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. 
Now, multiply five times 39 and see how many whacks that is. Thrice I was beaten with rods. That's the way the Romans did it. Once was a stone. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. And this one always has bothered me because I don't, I don't like deep water, especially an ocean-type situation. He says, a night and a day I've been in the deep. I can just think of things swimming around my feet. And some of the things that swim around your feet down here in the Gulf of the Ocean is a little bit bigger than this bottle right here. But notice, in journeys, often, in perils of waters, he brings it back up again. But in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, and in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. In other words, no place I haven't been in peril. That's what he's saying. But then this one. This must have hurt a lot. In perils of false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He's an apostle, you see. He's not, just, he's not an elder over one church working with the other elders. He's an apostle, an ambassador of Christ. And with the other apostles, through them Christ worked through all the churches. Who is weak, and I'm not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? Here's what got him through. Listen to his conclusion. If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. Now, I want everybody here to go home and say to yourself, I've suffered as much as Paul suffered for the cause of Christ. Is there not a cause? There's not a soul in these United States that's ever suffered like that for the cause of Christ. Paul never knew a building like this. And he said, a lot of buildings better than this one with a whole lot of them worse, and he didn't have any of them. He never knew a country like ours. He never had freedom of religion. The closest he had to any privilege was he was a Roman citizen, and that did allow a lot of privilege, but nothing like we have. Never had a say in the government, because you didn't have says in those governments. In those governments, it had say over you. Never had anything. Why, you know, he never went to a Walmart. He never went to an academy. <laughs> He never had all these wonderful, wonderful things that we have. What does that mean? When I read this, it's been my Bible all my life and I read it. What does it mean to you? Well, it better mean to us that what we have that he never had, we're expected to use for the cause of Christ. As David said, is there not a cause? What is there that's handicapping us? I don't care whether this building's full or ten times this size or whether two benches are here with people on it. It doesn't make any difference. It's what we are according to what we know the Bible teaches and using what we have before us that we might truly learn how to suffer for the cause of Christ. But you're going to have to be like David and then we're going to let the lesson be yours. Just remembering what Paul said to the church at Smyrna. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. David said there was a cause. He didn't have to do that, brethren. He could have gone home. He could have chosen the easy way out, the course of least resistance. But he didn't. He didn't say, let George do it. He didn't say, my brothers are here, let them take care of it. He didn't say, let King Saul do it. 
He was head and shoulders above everybody else in his height. He was, looked like a warrior and a leader. If they weren't doing it. If they're not going to do it, tell me why I should stick my neck on the block. There's the attitude that hurts more than anything else. When it comes to the church getting done what God says is the greatest work to ever face mankind. I told this story last night. I know it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn. It is not meant to be that way. Because it was when I was so young. And I promise you I had no knowledge of the Bible at that time like I have now. Although I wish I even had more now than I do. I was 17 years old. But I learned something about brethren. And I'm glad I learned it then because it's been proven 10 million times over, manner of speaking, ever since that time about brethren. Went to Bible class one night, the summer after graduating high school. Young man was there. At the devotional, he came forward. The invitation song made a confession of fault. We were in the same Bible class, so we went to the Bible class with the other teenagers, probably seven or eight, nine of us, into that class. And as we sat there waiting for the teacher to come, he began to tell about why he made his confession of fault. And he was sort of giddy about it. And I took note of that. And he worked for Safeway. And the man who managed Safeway was a member of another congregation of the Lord's people only across town. And I don't remember what Perry had done that he confessed but he told us in class that he confessed because the manager of Safeway, a member of the church at the other congregation, told him that if he did not confess and make repentance, put that in quotes, he was going to fire him from his job. Well, as I say, I didn't know much about the Bible, but I knew that didn't ring right. It would be one thing for a man to sit a person down and talk to him from the Bible about why he was in sin and his need to do it, but to threaten him to be fired to get him to make a confession of fault, I knew that wasn't right. So I asked him again to make sure I understood him. He told me again, as he did the others, what he had done and what, why he had come forward and what the man had done. Well, I, again, little old me, I said, that's not right. So I went to the elders. I think I told my daddy about it. Well, the word got back. And we were at a gospel meeting sometime along about that same time, a few days, at the other congregation. And that man came up to me because he had heard I'd been the one to say what I said. And he wasn't hateful to me, but he pretty well let me know that wasn't appreciated. Well, at 17, I had some of the same things I have now. I don't care what you think about it. So I was nice about it. I was respectful to him because he was older than my daddy. But I went back and talked about it. And it came to a meeting of the elders where I grew up with my daddy and me and with a young man and his father was dead so his mother was there and that man who managed Safeway, a brother. And we had a general meeting and the older folks kind of took over which it was what ought to have been. But it was verified that is exactly what happened. And he, uh, I don't know whether to say the man actually apologized or where he sort of backtracked. And I learned something right there. And that's why I'm telling this, really. It's not because I did it, because I've done a whole lot more than that later on than I have that one. It's because I could have shut up and sat there. That wasn't right, folks. There is no way you get a person to repent. There's no way that you get a person to do what God says. No way. And I knew that much Bible. So I put my two cents in. And I felt the first effects of a little bit of shunning and being persecuted. That was just the beginning, and that's where it sticks in my mind. Brethren, I don't mind saying to you, whether I did it, or Paul did it, or Timothy did it, or somebody else you know did it. When you see error, you have an obligation before God and to the people in the error to do your part. There is a cause. And you can't wait on somebody else to do it when you know what's right. Because there is a judgment day coming. 
And we're going to have to stand up and be counted whether we want to or not. There's been a lot of time since then that I've done some of the same thing on a whole lot of other matters. And there's been a whole lot of people that don't like me for it. But I'll say what I did last night that is attributed to Davy Crockett. Be sure you're right. And then go ahead. Well, whether Davy Crockett said that or not, I don't know. But I know that's what the Bible said, and I got an example of it in Jesus, but I have an example in the Old Testament of David. Because David could have very well stood there and looked at that and gone home. I hate to say it, but there are a number of brethren who look at it that way, and they don't know there is a cause, except that it's somebody else's responsibility, not their own. That won't cut it, brethren. Not if you're thinking of eternity. You see, even today, you may be somebody that needs to change something in your life to fit God's pattern because you let it slip. You'll have to repent. Nobody can do it for you. You'll have to resolve in your own mind, I have done wrong before God, and I have to repent and turn from that and stop it and go before God humbly and pray for forgiveness. Or if you need to become a Christian, you'll have to come to that conclusion personally. Desire to do what's right. Nobody can force you to. Nobody should force you to. Only the truth should persuade you to love the Lord and obey the gospel and be saved. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come to him while we stand and sing.